I love this Caustic Arrow MTX so much. It's so good. In this video, I'm going to go over some of the choices I've made with the build over the past week, try to answer some of the most commonly asked questions we've received about it, and just give some advice on the order in which to gear up in order to maximize your damage. Hi, it's Lerald, and I'm going to give a week one update on my Toxic Rain Pathfinder build. But first, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, let's just start right with the most common questions. I think number one is kind of how should you be playing this character in maps? And so I kind of want to talk about some of the benefits of Caustic Arrow versus Toxic Rain and kind of how they interact with each other and basically which you should be using when. So right off the bat, Toxic Rain, you know, it does a lot of damage. It has some downsides, though. First off, it's damage over time, which isn't necessarily a problem, but because you are able to stack it up a bunch of times in one location, a lot of the damage calculations, a lot of the thought process behind it is based off of this idea, right? That you're going to be stacking up a huge pile onto a, an enemy. And if you're just running around, like throwing a bunch of toxic rain pods into a pack of guys, it can be a little slow. And that is why we like Caustic Arrow, because Caustic Arrow basically has the exact opposite design of toxic rain. So we used Awakened Arrow Nova support because without it, as you can see, the area that Caustic Arrow fills up is about the same as toxic rain, so fairly small amount of space. So we use oh, Aero Nova. You can use Awakened or non-Awakened is fine too. Awakened really just gives you one extra arrow. And that will cause it to, as you can see, kind of fan out and really fill up a lot of space. Fill up a whole bunch of screen space, in fact. Now, because Caustic Arrow is a, a well, you know, it drops a pool on the ground. And by design, when it hits an enemy, the default is when it hits an enemy, it will stop and drop the pool on the ground. So if you have pierce, any sort of pierce at all, pierce from like an Eldritch Implicit on your gloves, pierce from the support gem, pierce, whatever. Um, if it pierces, it will drop a pool when it hits the enemy and pierces through them, but then continue on. It'll either continue until it has hit the end of its travel distance or until it hits enough enemies to stop being able to pierce. Now, a big thing with Caustic Arrow, and kind of the reason that we don't just use it as our main skill instead of Toxic Rain, is enemies can only take damage from one Caustic Arrow pool at a time. So having like infinite attack speed with Toxic Rain is great because that means you could stack up infinite pods and do infinite damage. But with Caustic Arrow, you can stack up infinite pools, you'll do one pool's worth of damage. The positive here is that that one pool from Tox or one pool from Caustic Arrow does a lot more damage than one shot from a Toxic Rain and it also co covers like a lot more area. So basically when you're running around in maps, you know, you have a couple of maintenance buffs. You want to maintain malevolence with divine blessing support and you want to maintain your life flask. And then as you're running through a map, you're pretty much just Caustic Arrowing around and just kind of filling the world, filling the the map with tons and tons of caustic arrow pools to kill all the white mobs, all of the magic monsters, and even a lot of the, like, I don't know, less tanky rares, basically. And when you do run into a tanky rare, one that's kind of giving you some trouble, you hit them in the face with a bunch of toxic rain, they die, and then you keep moving on. And that is basically the approach for most mapping and most sort of, like, speedy content. It's really only when you get into the kind of long-term, sustained, and single-target engagements, or, you know, whatever, long-term engagements anyway, where you want to like really start laying on the Toxic Rain. Now, because we use Mirage Archer support with Toxic Rain, it's not a bad idea to just kind of Toxic Rain every 10 seconds, 5, 10 seconds or so. I'm not actually sure off the top of the dome how long Mirage Archer lasts. 12.6 seconds. All right, sure. Well, you know, check your tooltip and see how long it lasts and try to use Toxic Rain at least once in that time frame. But other than that, it really is just kind of move and Caustic Arrow, move and Caustic Arrow, move and Caustic Arrow. Now, as for the support gems you want to use with Caustic Arrow, that can fluctuate a little bit. If you're kind of running things on the cheap, a regular Awakened or a non-Awakened Arrow Nova support works just fine. Because like, you know, as I said before, having five arrows versus six arrows, it's really just more about like the amount of space that you're able to fill with the Caustic uh, Arrow pools. It's you're not getting any more damage out of having a sixth pool in terms of like single target damage, it's just so you get more coverage out of having that sixth arrow from Awakened Arrow Nova support. Void manipulation is really good for any sort of chaos damage over time skill, and that's also true here. 
and then Awakened Vicious Proj, or non-Awakened, that's fine. And Swift Affliction support is also really good. Swift Affliction adds a ton of damage, 40% more damage over time, which is huge. It has the downside of less duration, so that makes it really bad for Toxic Rain and for a lot of, uh, well, uh, some damage over time applications anyway, but because it's so easy to main maintain 100% uptime on Caustic Arrow, and there's basically just no downside to using Swift Affliction as Caustic Arrow. So it's a really, really good support gem for CA. And then kind of your last option, you can use efficacy support. It does give you more damage over time. It also gives you increased skill effect duration, which doesn't really matter all that much for CA. Or you can just use Empower. I'm still leveling mine up. It's, you know, ultimately that would be the ideal. Like, just like with Toxic Rain, you do get a lot of your damage scaling out of just more gym levels. Another big advantage of Caustic Arrow is that it has a Vol version, and the Vol version, unlike the default version, will basically leave lines on the ground in all the directions that the Caustic Arrows shoot out, and they do a ton of damage. So it kind of gives you a burst damage cooldown, something you can throw onto uh, tanky rares and map bosses and that sort of thing. In terms of whether you need a six link for your Caustic Arrow support, I was clearing T16s, you know, kind of first few days of the league, uh, with a four link for my Caustic Arrow support. And there's kind of <laughs> Caustic Arrow setup. It's kind of an advantage, honestly, to having the like four or the five link is that you have a bit more uh, in the like fifth and six gym slots that aren't uh, linked up to Caustic Arrow to kind of work with some of your other skills. Like in expanding to a six link, I've had to drop uh, Blink Arrow, which is fine. Like I don't really miss Blink Arrow all that much, but I have given that up. Now, what about like using totems instead? Some people use Toxic Rain with Focus Ballista totem supports, and this helps with keeping 15 Wither stacks up on bosses for maximizing your single target damage. It's definitely something you can do. I find it very annoying to do while mapping. I find it honestly pretty annoying to do while bossing too. I just find it inconvenient. I have done it in the past and I haven't bothered this league and I really don't miss it. I have basically just whenever I'm bossing, I'll try to keep a caustic arrow under the boss most of the time unless they're moving a lot. And then I will just blast him in the face with as much toxic rain as I possibly can. Ultimately, totems, ballista totems, thumbs down for me. I'm glad to have moved on. Now, automation support is something I talked about kind of hypothetically before the league and hadn't really talked all that much about what I've been doing with it. And basically, I just took a, like a RGB three link here and I just did withering step and immortal call in with the automation. And when you have automation at level 20 with 20 quality, it has no increase to the cooldown. So it just basically spam cast withering step and immortal call on cooldown. Now, do you want to have withering call being used on cooldown? It kind of interferes with your flame dash charges and your ability to cast flame dash sometimes. I would say it's not perfect, right? You can just remove it and manually cast them for bosses, but for mapping, for convenience, it's really nice to take those two keybinds away. You know, it, that, that is kind of the goal here, right? Is to make everything super smooth for mapping. So most of the time when you're running around mapping, you're hitting malevolence like every 25 seconds or so to keep it up. You're hitting your life flask every five seconds or so, tens of however long your life flask lasts. And then you're just caustic arrowing everything until you run into a particularly tanky mob and then you're toxic raining them down. And I don't really want to introduce having to also hit a mortal call and withering step into that. So I like automation support for that. I do have them like on keybinds just literally so I can watch their cooldown and see if they're up or whatever. Um, not really necessary at all. It's just something I've been playing around with. I will say that the sound that's coming from Automation support hitting these skills on cooldown forever is kind of annoying in the hideout So I have been turning it off whenever I'm like making a video or just sitting around in the hideout trading for a while I have been turning it off uh, I do find this to be a lot more reliable than cast when damage taken when it comes to using a mortal call and like Consistently, it's also cheaper. I think cast when damage taken has like a 250% mana multiplier and automation is 150% So it's definitely like better for mana as well all right, now let's uh, move on to Mana Forged Arrows. That is something that's been asked about. It, it can work still. It does need a lot of investment now. All the methods that you used to use with flasks to make them reduce your mana costs have been gone. Now we knew the Veiled mod was gonna be removed in the patch. We were um, taken by surprise that they also have stealth nerfed Mana Flasks as well. That suffix that you used to use Mana Flask 
to reduce mana cost. That was just totally taken out, and that wasn't in the patch notes at all. So that really means that the only way to be able to use Mana Forged Arrows anymore and like make the mana cost work, make it so that you're getting your Toxic Rain down to like one or two mana per cast, is to use Ring and Amulet prefixes, all three of them to use this, this prefix right here. Non-channeling skills have minus seven a total mana cost. You also need to use the Life Mastery that converts 30% uh, of your mana cost into life. And then you probably also need to use a Clarity Watcher's Eye with like minus mana cost of skills while you have Clarity active. That does mean you'll need to pick up enough um, what mana cost, mana reservation efficiency. So like you probably would want to spec into Sovereignty with your uh, with your Amulet Anoint and be able to fit Clarity in. That also means you need to fit Clarity in as a gym somewhere in your gear too so it's doable kind of expensive definitely has more of a um more of an impact on your gearing and just also like more of a gearing budget to make it work and i really do think that this play style works pretty well so i it's not something i'm going to be pursuing in the short term but maybe long term it's a possibility uh you will also need an eldritch helm implicit to reduce the cost of your skills which obviously you can't get an eldritch implicit on a uh, unique helm and something I'd seen some questions about, like, I have seen some POBs, some people on POB Ninja that have uh, either Eldritch Battery or Devouring Diadem giving them Eldritch Battery that are still using Mana Forged Arrows. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. If you're using Eldritch Battery, if you're spinning Energy Shield, you cannot trigger Mana Forged Arrows. Like, maybe there's some hypothetical where they're burning 100% of their Energy Shield and then somehow spending a little bit of mana, but I don't think so. I think they're probably just going off of old information and maybe they're, like, doing... POB warrior stuff or something. I Yeah, I don't really get it. It doesn't make sense at all. Okay, now I want to kind of talk about the big one here. How should you upgrade your gear? What's the order of operations for maximizing your damage and still maintaining a good level of defensive value? We did make a full video on how to upgrade every single piece of gear throughout the entire end game about a month or so ago, and I think the only thing that's really changed since then is that GGG removed the reduced mana cost veiled flask suffix, so devouring diadem, I mentioned it, I believe, in that video as being like something people used to do. It's kind of now the go to for your end game helm. And this actually makes things a lot easier in terms of gearing. You're not necessarily having to spend a double digit amount of divines crafting a really nice helm. You could basically just buy a diadem for like the last I looked, they were like a divine or two. It's not not too bad in terms of getting set up there. So if you want full details, uh, full details on gear, you should check that video out, but I'll just kind of give the shorter version here. Getting yourself to that range of 37 to 43% increased area of effect is really important for maximizing your single target damage, making sure all of your toxic rain pods overlap onto large targets, onto single targets. So there are three places you can get that from your gear. There's Helm, which if you're using a diadem, which eventually you probably will be, so that kind of rules that out. And the other two are gloves and amulet. So any of these are fine. You just want to have it on basically two of them. And that means gloves and amulet. There are technically some other places like if you use a warlord ring, AOE is a possible prefix. It's really hard to get, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it's an option. You can also get it on corrupted jewel implicits, like jewels that you socket into your uh, passive skill tree. So a couple of corrupted jewels with increased area of effect might be able to free you up from having to use a amulet prefix for that. But yeah, it's definitely like this is the easiest approach is to just do your amulet and your gloves by far the easiest approach. And then you get the other 20 percent. You get, you know, 20 percent from the bow mastery. So you really just need to make up something in the range of like 17 to 23 percent and gloves and neck will get that covered. Your weapon is kind of the most important piece of gear for increasing your damage, and it's generally the most cost effective one as well. I, normally, I would have some visual aids here, but I think I sold them off to other people. You want to start by just getting a quill rain. There's not really anything complex about it. You just buy a quill rain, get up to like four sockets, link them and then use that to start out. That's very much like finishing the campaign, white maps, that kind of thing. As soon as you've gotten about 30 chaos or so, you want to buy six porcupine div cards and upgrade to a six link short bow that shouldn't be too expensive. You want to roll that bow with tier two essences of dread. I think I have some of those in my stash tab here. Yeah, these bad boys right here. Shrieking essences of dread. That's all you need. And you really have two options. You can just basically roll like you can just slam it with essences of dread until you have an empty suffix and then craft attack speed on it. That's what I did. I think it took me one essence of dread to pull off on day one. 
if you want to be a little bit more expensive with it, which the point of this is kind of to be budget, but if you wanted to, you could roll it until you get natural attack speed and a free suffix and then craft chaos dot multi as a suffix instead. Either of these two setups will hold you off basically until you can craft your eventual permanent end game bow. I did Eater and Exarch with that porcupine bow with just a very basic like crafted attack speed and the plus two level of socketed bow gems that worked for me. Um, I think basically everything else I was wearing was like crappy rare gear other than a lightning coil, a four link lightning coil. And I do recommend lightning coil. I think that's pretty hard to get away from using that. You can use a topaz flask and purity of elements to offset the minus 60 lightning res that it comes with. And once you've done that, you will be a lot tankier than if you're not running it. I mean, that 50% of fizz converted to lightning damage is huge. Once you've done all of that, you've got that all set up, you can either buy a devouring diadem or farm betrayal for it. I did farm for it, but like I said, they've been cheaper than I expected this league, so I would probably just try to buy one. Now, if the price goes up, they're not too hard to farm. Low level betrayal is actually not that dangerous and will generate a ton of scarabs. So it is also an option like I self farmed basically all the scarabs I needed to do several other strategies after that. So that was kind of nice as a setup for kind of the rest of the league. However you get it, Devouring Diadem will completely solve your mana problems. You want to be sure to spec out of Eldritch Battery and into Energy Shield Mastery. This one here, right here, it increases your energy shield from your equipped helmet by 100%, and that'll totally fix all of your mana. You will want a diadem, preferably that either grants resistances, it'll always be something and chaos res, or that grants uh, strength and int. Those are basically the only good unveiled mods that you can get on a diadem. You also want to be sure to pick up a taste of hate. Um, you know, this is just a really good flask. It'll give you a lot of cold res and increase your max cold res, which is useful. It also just gives you a lot of fizz to cold conversion. I probably need to upgrade from this 11% one to one that is closer to like 14 or 15% of fizz converted to cold. That'll definitely make me quite a bit tankier as well. Just something I haven't gotten around to doing yet. And once you've done all of that, done all of that setup, you want to save up about six to 10 divines to make yourself an end game bow. Something like this right here. We made a video recently about how to farm Einhar and Alva at uh, low levels, and that is the approach I would recommend for saving up that currency if you don't have it already. The prices on Krykic Chimerals from Einhar and Loki of Corruption from Alva are already rising. They're getting pretty high pretty quickly, so that is a really good strategy if you are kind of broke. Once you have those divines, you want to buy a six link uh, I level 78 thicket bow and craft it up. Short bows and grove bows will also work. They're basically all the same bow. Just for the sake of not adding like an extra five or 10 minutes onto this video, I'll just refer you to that other video if you want the details on how to craft it. It's it'll be in the description. One important note, though, is just remember to make sure you use perfect fossils to get the quality up to at least 28 percent before you do the rest of the craft, since you can't use Hillock to upgrade weapon quality anymore. If you've already made that mistake, it's not the end of the world. The point is just to enchant it with that harvest enchant that gives you 1% attack speed per eight quality. It doesn't um, it doesn't round up, so you're not going to get two and a half percent. You're just going to get two. So you do miss out on one percent attack speed. Worst case scenario, you can go uh, beast craft and corrupt it up to level or 30 quality. That does mean corrupting it that that will lock it in amber forever. But that particular beast craft doesn't do anything except set it to 30 quality. And then it's and then it's corrupted. Can't do anything with it anymore. But like you don't really need to. I mean, it's it's a in game thicket bow. So like that is still an option. If you've made that mistake, you can just corrupt it to 30 and then you're good. After you've made your in-game bow, making a despair on hit ring is a really good idea. It's a pretty simple craft. You just want to buy an eye level 80 plus hunter ring and then do harvest caster rerolls on it until you're happy with it. Basically, you're looking for despair and then like whatever other stats you need. It could be strength and it. It could be resistances. It can be whatever. Life is good. If you can get an empty prefix to be able to craft non channeling skills have minus total mana cost. That's great. I wasn't so lucky this time. I probably will make another despair on hit ring down the line that is a little better, but you know, this is where I'm at for now. After that, I would switch over to using one large cluster jewel setup and you'll set that up over here. It'll be a chaos cluster jewel setup. It'll be eight passive skills. You want three notables and those are specifically unholy grace, unwaveringly evil and wicked Paul. None of the other notables that are available on chaos clusters are like even close to their value. 
you'll then want to use at least uh, well, basically just one increased flask effect duration cluster jewel, a medium one, and that would have spiked concoction on it as kind of a mandatory option, and then brood for potency is a mandatory, but it is the next best. And then I prefer to go with a chaos damage over time, medium cluster jewel, especially early on while I'm still like working on chaos res, you can take student of decay, that's kind of your second best option, and wicked Paul is the best notable on those chaos damage over time clusters. So once you've got this set up, this whole like the trifecta of these three cluster jewels in conjunction with the six link thicket bow that's like in game crafted and all of that you're ready to blast like that is the point where the game like the game truly opens up your damage truly comes online and you're definitely able to take down maven and uber elder i did all of this stuff before i took on those two bosses and they really you know it really reduced the difficulty like can you take them on with the porcupine bow and without the cluster jewels and all that absolutely but your damage will be low. It will take a long time to kill those two bosses. So you do really need to be good at the fights in order to handle them with that level of gear. And like having this much more damage, it really reduces the amount of time that you're in those fights, makes them a lot easier. Now, after that, you kind of do want to work on getting yourself a plus one chaos skills amulet. If you can get room to craft an AOE prefix on it as well, that's really, really valuable. Ideally, you would get it on an agate amulet base. That's strength and int. And that is the best choice. Bonus points if it has dot multi on it as well. I made this one with Rog. I got very lucky, and that is why it's not on the ideal base. Citron amulet, not the correct base. Strength dex. Uh, it should be strength int, but this is what he gave me, so I'll take it. And you want to make sure you anoint potency of will on it as well for more skill effect duration and potency of will is this uh, notable here. I already mentioned it before, but you want to make sure you have pierce somewhere in your gear for your caustic arrow, whether it's in your link setup for caustic arrow or as an implicit on your gloves. You want to uh, that's eater of worlds implicit. So like, you know, your options there, I think, are basically spell suppression for your eater of worlds uh, implicit or pierce i kind of would rather have the pierce i think you know i'll pick up spell suppression elsewhere basically once you've done that you want to upgrade your quiver i think quiver is kind of the next on the list here and then you want to work on your rare jewels which i haven't worked on my rare jewels at all yet so i'll just talk about making this quiver my goal and kind of the thing i recommended in the crafting video and the, the thing i still think is like the right call normally would be to look for a broad head arrow quiver with dot multi to uh, attack skills with that as a fractured mod unfortunately they were very expensive when i was looking for them and uh, fractured life wasn't so i bought one with fractured life and then i just did basically the same craft i would have i spammed deafening essences of woe i think i have some of those around here we go and they give you increased damage with bow skills. And so I just spammed like 30 or 40 deafening essences of woe on it until I got a dot multi uh, with attack skills suffix that I was happy with. And then unfortunately, all of the suffixes were full on that craft. I think the other suffix was like a resistance. And so I said, all right, well, I got to I got to play the gamble a null game and so i gambled and i didn't hit the dot multi or the damage with bow skills with the annul so ultimately i felt like i was pretty happy and then i crafted attack speed and then you know there we are pretty good quiver pretty good at this point in the league i haven't really done anything with my gloves yet they're definitely not uh ideal or perfect my boots are okay they're not really that amazing either i definitely need to get some suppression on my gear somewhere like right now i am not suppression capped i'm uh somewhat close and i am running this uh this mastery here chance to suppress spell damage is lucky there are definitely some things that we can do to kind of fix that up uh and so i'll just kind of talk about where my, where my character is at now i've killed the feared i have finished my atlas we're at like 115 here and 132 here. I have double six links, although again, as I said before, I was kind of slamming through tier 16s with, with Caustic Arrow on like a four link and definitely on a five link, it was like totally smooth sailing. I haven't touched tier 17s yet on uh, in Necropolis. I did do them on Standard League and they were, they were fine. I mean, technically speaking, they were incredibly deadly, but, you know, fine. They're they're definitely like next up on the list of things to kind of go accomplish, go tackle. And so I will link a path of building for this character. I'm not going to put like all of the same level of um, notes and stuff that I had put into the previous one. This will just be sort of like this is where this character's at. And then I will also put in the the 
planner path of building that I had from the league start because I've been following along with that as well. That is what I've been using. But this is just like if you wanted to know exactly where this character is at, here it is a snapshot of it in Amber right now. Uh, I will just kind of look at some of this gear here. It's all pretty normal stuff. Toxic Rain, Empower, Mirage Archer, Efficacy, Void Manipulation, and Vicious Proj. Uh, Vol Caustic Arrow, Arrow Nova, Void Manipulation, Vicious Proj, Swift Affliction, and Empower. I, like I said, I'm using the automation support. I am using Defiance Banner. Having the Diadem gives you enough mana reservation efficiency that you can fit in like one extra small aura and Defiance Banner gives you a lot of value for very little cost. Other than that, we're using, you know, Haste, Grace, Purity of Elements, all linked to an Enlighten. It's not level four. I don't know why that's <laughs> set to level four. Uh, and then we have Malevolence, Divine Blessing, Inspiration linked together to use that as a uh, Divine Blessing Malevolence. And then Flame Bash is kind of my one mobility skill, and then we have to spare on Hit Ring, so that's all of our skills. Pretty straightforward stuff. I think most of the gear I've already covered, really. The only things that I've kind of left are, I did buy a Watcher's Eye. I just bought one that gave you a uh, phasing while affected by haste. Very basic, not very like good or valuable. My goal long-term is to upgrade to one, and I think I might've put it in the build here. Uh, one that gives you some amount of Fizz converted to elemental damage while affected by purity of elements. Now, there aren't a lot of those floating around right now. They're like 10 divines or something. This one that I pulled off of the trade website has not one, but two Fizz converted to elemental damage while affected by purity. So this one's like 100 divines or something. And this one, as you can see, would increase uh, my Fizz max hit by like uh, 50%. So, you know kind of big definitely uh definitely very expensive very much a chase item but like something that i would love to get before the end of the league now obviously you can use like malevolence increases your dot multi as a watcher's eye people usually go for damage mods with their watcher's eye i think the reason that i like to go for more utility and defensive mods is because they're cheaper generally but if you go like super defensive then it comes back around and becomes expensive again uh, the real downside to going for damage mods with the Watcher's Eye is just simply that it's very, very expensive. I think my immediate goal for the character is mainly just to like upgrade my gloves so that I will actually be suppression capped for real instead of just close. I also need Chaos Res. Uh, I am at like 55 or 56 Chaos Res instead of 75, so I'm going to need to like upgrade some rare jewels in the tree, and I would like to switch over to two cluster jewels once I'm level 98 or so. I talked about that in the other POB, and basically it would just be up basically just about the same Buster Jewel setup, but up in this socket as well. And I would mainly be dropping like this wheel and the um, the Constitution setup in order to get that. I also want to start adding tattoos to replace a lot of my dexterity nodes. Like I'm very much over the amount of dexterity I need. If we go to the calx tab, we can see exactly how much we need. Right, I require 179, I'm at 283. I can give up a lot of dex nodes. And similarly, I need 140 int, but that's really only because I have over leveled my flame dash. Like if I lower that down to like 11 or 10 or whatever that number is, then the amount of int that you need is only like 112 to equip a de uh, devouring diadem. So I think that basically I can get away with adding quite a lot of tattoos to fill in some of these int nodes and some of the dex nodes. And that would be good because you can use suppression tattoos. Um, right, let's see. Mage Bane here gives you 1% chance to spell suppress per 15 dex. So that's for every three small dex nodes, you get 2% uh, suppression. The tattoos give you 2% suppression per node. So basically you're gaining like for every three nodes you're gaining four percent suppression compared to dex and that's the only thing that you're getting out of dex because you don't care about chance to hit and you're not getting evasion out of dex so it's just a straight upgrade so i could use that to kind of fill in some suppression as well basically get some on the gloves finish off the rest of the suppression i need with tattoos that is the plan you can also get four percent flask effect duration per dex tattoo as well so i absolutely will fit as many of those in as i can once i've finished suppression out it might only be a couple of them but you know that is kind of the plan. And then finally, you can get 5% reduced extra damage from crits as an int tattoo. And so I'll probably try to fit in a couple of those as well to take the edge off of some of the crit damage that some of the mobs have uh, from the Necropolis mechanic. I think upgrading to a Corrupted Lightning Coil, like this Lightning Coil, it's okay. It's kind of a minimum roll, actually. 
but you know upgrading to a lightning coil that has like a reduced extra damage taken from from crits implicit would be good or maybe just like increase max all res just you know some sort of defensive modifier or offensive modifier whatever but basically double corrupting lightning coils for a while try and get some more uh, defensive and offensive value there those two bonuses the crit damage reduction on a lightning coil or any body armor and then like from tattoos those two stack so they can really help a lot with making you a lot more tanky in the current league Beyond that, I just kind of need to spend some time actually grinding XP. I'm too low level right now. I spent a lot of time doing low level farm stuff, which was good. It was like good for making a video, but also just very cheap and efficient and kind of helped me get the ball rolling myself, but not actually good for leveling up. You know, if you're level 94 and you're farming level 69 content, that's not going to give you a lot of XP. I also want to upgrade some of my support gems. Like I don't have a level four in power yet. I kind of want to double corrupt this just for the higher chance of getting that level four in power, but I definitely want a level four in power in the, in the weapon. I do want to switch over from regular void manipulation to an awakened void manipulation in the caustic arrow setup. And I did just buy a Tides of Time, the Uber Shaper belt, right before making the video here. I haven't played with it yet, but I, I mean, I already know how it's going to work. It puts nearly all of my flask uh, uptimes. Basically, everything except for Silver Flask is at 100% pretty easily. It also added about a thousand life per second of regen from the Life Flask. So it's good. It's also shockingly cheap, despite how good it is. Even with good rolls, there are like five or six divines for the tides of time like this one with amazing rolls so it's like six divines with bad rolls you can realistically buy one for like a hundred chaos or less and then just try to gamble divine spam it into being good by hand that is a gamble though so i wouldn't necessarily recommend it but if you're feeling lucky maybe go for it also if you're feeling lucky maybe try using alva temples and like double corrupt some of these bad boys in order to make ones that have really good implicit modifiers, corrupted implicit modifiers, because the default implicit is pretty bad. Armor and evasion rating is like, it's a really bad base, but if you can double corrupt this into having like increased attack speed or move speed or increased malevolence effect or something like that, this could be an absolutely insane belt. I think that's probably something I'm going to try and do in a couple of weeks, like maybe a little project I'll do once I feel like screwing around, I've kind of accomplished some of my goals for the league. But until then, some of the shorter term goals I have are to like farm for a headhunter and a progenesis and then eventually work toward a mage blood to play around with other builds and kind of have fun with them. And, you know, I think that this this belt is going to be pretty nice. It basically is like a perfect flask belt, but then it doesn't have any life. Like I was using this belt beforehand. It obviously has a massive amount of life and it has pretty good flask mods on it. But, you know, this is significantly better at giving you more flask effect than you could possibly get from a rare belt and also just way more flask uptime than you could ever get from a rare belt. And the 100% increased life recovery is basically for any Pathfinder build, like just a free thousand life per second. So it's very, I mean, it's it's cracked for Pathfinders, but it doesn't have any life. It doesn't have any resistances and the, the base is bad. So it's like not really that useful for any non Pathfinder builds, and that is why it is not really all that expensive, despite coming from an Uber boss. I have been thinking about how to craft good items in the graveyard for Toxic Rain Pathfinder. Let's just go there to like look around and pretend that we're going to do something. I, I think a lot of the normal generically useful items like good boots, good rings, that kind of thing would probably not be too hard. I am currently working on making a um, uh, a <laughs> lightning arrow or tornado shot and a spine bow. So I think the problem with using the graveyard to craft stuff for toxic rain is like the best in slot weapon is a hunter weapon and you can't guarantee hunter. You can only like give yourself a random shot at having one of the uh, one of the conqueror influences with the graveyard. So I, I kind of feel like that's right out of the window. Unfortunately, the same is true for your best of slot quiver. That also would be a hunter quiver. So you're kind of like ruled out for both weapon and quiver when it comes to the graveyard. So I don't think Necropolis is going to be a solution for either of those. Now, maybe it could work for making a plus two neck, but I don't know. I think the traditional method of buying a fractured dot multi amulet and then just alt spamming it like literally like 6000 times to get a plus one all skill gems and then Doing all the rest of the stuff you need to do from there is probably going to be a more effective method, even if it is incredibly painful to your wrist. Ultimately, I don't know how good Necropolis 
crafting is going to be for like the specific things that you want for Toxic Rain Pathfinder, like weapon, neck and quiver. But I think for the more generic stuff, you know, gloves, boots, rings, I think it's going to be still pretty good. I wish it were good for belts, but the main mods that you want on belts are flask mods. And even if they have no tags or, or they have no tags at all. So I don't think it's possible to make a good belt uh, for Toxic Rain Pathfinder, really like any sort of flask finder belt with the graveyard, which is pretty disappointing. You would basically want to reduce the chance of everything to spawn and then increase the chance of flasks, but they have no tags. So there's nothing like I just don't see how you could make a good flask belt. I'm sure that some genius will figure it out, but I'm, I'm not that smart. In conclusion, good for rings and rare armor. Probably not for weapon quiver and belt and maybe on the neck. I'm going to have to spend some time kind of looking into it and thinking about that for a while. All right, I know this is kind of long winded, but I hope this answered um, all of the lingering questions you might have about Toxic Rain Pathfinder in the current state of the patch and kind of progressing in through the end game. But feel free to ask uh, if you do have any other questions and also be sure to like and subscribe. And thanks for watching. Bye.